I would like to talk about seven different market failures in economics. And these are imperfect competition, like monopoly power, imperfect information, public goods, common pool resources, externalities, the Matthew principle, and inequality. And so basically you start out economics thinking about uh, gains to trade, about productive efficiency and allocative efficiency, where productive efficiency is basically um, if you look at the supply and demand curve graph with all of the assumptions that go into this, um, you get a situation where the people who are most productive at producing something, those are the people who actually end up producing that's these producers here, and the people who want that thing the most, that's these people here, are the ones to get the product. So with the supply curve, we have productive efficiency, that this works to make things as efficiently as possible, given the assumptions. And then allocative efficiency is the, the people who get the scarce resources are the ones who value it the most. Now, of course, that assumes that um, everybody has equal money. So once you add inequality to the mix, that's going to uh, reduce the allocative efficiency. We'll get to that at the very end. But basically, all of these market failures are failures that um, identify situations when the wonderful things we like about markets sort of break down and fail. And of course, you see these all over the economy, and so uh, the field of economics in a, in a large part is about studying these market failures and figuring out how do we um, bring things back, how do we patch the holes in the system that come up because of the market failures. So let me talk a little bit about each of these. So imperfect competition is basically about monopoly power. It's about the fact that there are some things, such as economies of scale and uh, network effects and whatnot, that leave firms to have some power in the market to raise price above the marginal cost or above the cost of production, and that power can be exercised in a variety of ways. So of course the monopoly model is sort of one of the bases of thinking about imperfect competition. And of course imperfect competition is not just monopolies because oligopolies and monopolistic competition, those industry types actually do have some degree of market power and therefore they can exercise monopoly control. Now the monopoly model really only gets at price whereas we can look at uh, the world today and see that sometimes this market power um, from imperfect competition will be used to reset the rules of the game, perhaps the game in a market. For example, we have a lot of uh, digital industries that are platforms that essentially are, are like these mini governments regulating a mini economy within the platform. So uh, monopoly power and the power to exert its will uh, is one market failure. And of course for all of these there will be government solutions and private solutions as well. Um, with monopoly power and imperfect competition, antitrust law is one way the government can address these. And that of course is where uh, the government tells firms to uh, that they're not allowed to merge with each other because if the firms merged then the the resulting firm would be way too big in the market and would have too much market power. So that's one of the things that um, the government does through the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice is they look at the environment and try to seek out where is imperfect competition causing problems in the economy and they try to regulate or sue these companies to stop that. Imperfect information relaxes the assumption that both sides of the market have perfect information about the service or product that they're trading with. And of course there are a lot of products where you have to buy the product first and you learn later on what the quality is. Like an apple or a musical or a doctor's appointment, all of those have these characteristics where it's actually pretty difficult for a lot of people to evaluate the quality before they buy it. So asymmetric information is part of this, but imperfect information includes moral hazard and adverse selection as well. And um, those are somewhat complicated concepts, but the basic idea with adverse selection is that um, when you buy a product, um, the quality of the product depends on who also selected to buy that product. So uh, with healthcare, this might be, are you selecting into an insurance uh, pool with a lot of really sick people? And if so, then the price of the insurance is going to be driven up by the people who selected there. 
So that's going to create all kinds of market distortions. Um, it creates an incentive for firms to avoid sick patients. And yeah, it's, it's a mess. Um, I have other videos on that, which I will link to below. And moral hazard is where uh, the product you're buying has some kind of contract with it. And the contract creates its own incentive. And an example might be bike insurance. If you buy insurance, if your bike gets stolen, that creates an incentive to, uh, to not lock up your bike or a disincentive to be as cautious about like locking up your bike. And when people follow that incentive, that could actually drive up the price of the product or drive down the quality of the product if the company is making up for the high costs dealing with uh, moral hazard. Uh, by, by cutting costs within the firm. So those are uh, somewhat complicated concepts. I'll link below once again. And with imperfect information, there's going to be lots of uh, private market solutions to that. If you look at Amazon's webpage, they have decent information about product quality that you can read the reviews, they have the star system. That is a private solution to imperfect information. But of course, regulation can also do the trick where you can't sell a product unless it reaches government standards of some sort, or government by could also put out information like um, on food labels, that kind of thing. Public goods are goods that are non-rival and non-excludable, meaning once the good exists, everybody can enjoy the good without diminishing anyone else's ability to enjoy the good. That's non-rival. And non-excludable means once the good exists, you can't stop someone from enjoying it. So like classic examples here are military protection and protection from asteroids. Other examples on a smaller level might include fireworks displays where you can't stop anyone in the town from enjoying the fireworks display. So it's non-excludable and it's non-rival because one person's enjoyment does not diminish another person's enjoyment. And of course with public goods, you have the free rider problem where everyone wants to enjoy the public good without contributing to the financing of it. So government provision is a classic solution to public goods problems, but you can also have uh, private groups or private companies come in and, and provide that good for, for the community. And you might even imagine with, uh, with fireworks displays, you might imagine a group of citizens saying, hey, we would love a great fireworks display. The, the five of us or the 20 of us are willing to pay for it. Let's do that and then it'll be provided for the whole town. So there can be both private and uh, public solutions. Now common pool resource problems have to do with the tragedy of the commons. As a matter of fact, maybe I should even just write that here. Let me do that. And in many textbooks, the tragedy of the commons is considered a subcategory of public goods. I'm separating it here because basically I love these two. I think they're very meaningful and important in the economy and they have different properties. So public goods, um, there's a private benefit. Everybody benefits from the public goods, but the cost has the drop in the bucket problem. Whereas tragedy of the commons is going to be the reverse of that. The cost is going to be drop in the bucket because everybody contributes a little bit to the problem, but when you add up all of this small contributions to the negative side effects of it, um, you get a huge problem. And of course, the classic example of tragedy of the commons is there's a common space where the farmers in a community are grazing their cows and everybody has an incentive to overgraze the space such that the grass doesn't grow back next year. And everyone would benefit if everyone would cut back how much they graze their cows to just enough such that the commons replenished. And of course the analogy with fisheries is, um, is, is important as well and with uh, rivers that irrigate gate one's crops. Basically, people overuse a resource as a common version of tragedy of the commons, and that degrades the quality of the commons. Now, of course, this can relate to digital spaces as well. You might imagine when people have, um, when people use digital spaces, sometimes they'll do things that will degrade that space. Though each individual's contribution to the degradation is very small, but when you add it up, um, the degradation gets huge. So that's tragedy of the commons. Externalities is going to be where the decisions that are made by the participants in a market, and this is both the suppliers and the demanders, they're sort of coming together to come up with something that's mutually beneficial between those two groups. But externalities happen when 
someone outside the market or someone who is not part of that decision-making mechanism gets affected. And of course, classic examples here are pollution is a negative externality. You can have positive externalities as well. For example, gardening, um, when a producer decides to produce flowers and your neighbor decides to buy them, you benefit from the flowers that exist in your neighborhood that you get to see. So externalities are just effects on people who are outside of the market or outside of the decision-making process. Now, you might imagine Tragedy of the Commons actually does also relate to externalities because, of course, um, the, the farmer grazing cattle in the field, that's an externality to the community if they overgraze. So I think one of the reasons if you see these lists of market failures, sometimes Tragedy of the Commons is clustered with these two because it's kind of in between. And of course, government solutions here include regulation and cap and trade, things like that. Private solutions involve the coast theorem where you give people property rights and they can uh, make deals between themselves to reduce externalities, like externalities on a smaller scale with your neighbors, you might imagine the neighborhood would come together and negotiate as a group. The Matthew principle is a principle at play in many systems, and it's basically the notion of power to the powerful. It comes from the Bible verse that says, to everyone who has, more will be given, and to everyone who has not, even what they have will be taken away. And it's basically that um, you can sort of do the math if you do this thought experiment. I've done it in another video and I'll put that below. But basically, um, when people get money, they can use that money to expand their own control over the system or to rewrite the rules in their favor or to get money in a way that is predatory. And over time, that tends to escalate such that um, inequality and, and growing inequality can be a natural feature of many systems, including economies. And inequality, of course, I mentioned at the beginning that this is going to disrupt allocative efficiency because the economy and the structures being built increasingly over time as inequality uh, rises, they increasingly serve people with uh, the most amount of money and people with smaller and smaller shares of money uh, are going to have less and less of a say in terms of allocative efficiency toward themselves. So these are seven market failures. They're not necessarily the only market failures, but they're uh, classic ones that students of economics should consider.